dear friends, welcome to another episode of the Inevitable Podcast. In this episode, I have the honor and pleasure of being here with my friend Paulo Martins, um, another Brazilian that I've had the opportunity to meet while I was living in the Bay Area. We've known each other for about eight, nine years, and uh, Paulo is uh, a fighter, a hustler, and certainly someone that scores exceptionally high on the inevitable ethos. Uh, someone who's not willing to quit ever. Uh, for for also for those that don't know, uh, Paulo is the CEO of Arena, their data platform for consumer enterprises, helping them increase engagement, conversion rates, and revenue across a multitude of uh, uh, media channels. They're backed by Craft Ventures, by CRV, Redpoint, TechStars, and have customers such as Microsoft, Fox, Globo, and Sony. Uh, before that. Paulo was a part of the ads product team at Hulu and helped scale the company to over a billion dollars in revenue. He was a part of the product team that actually scaled paid subscribers from $100,000 to over $7 million in two years. Um, before that, he was working at Ubisoft as a data engineer. And before that, he was actually a software engineer in NASA uh, doing data mining and machine learning. Uh, aside from that, um, he also enjoys lifting heavy things like myself, and <laughs> we uh, have uh, you know several uh, common, I think, um, hobbies and perspectives in life. So uh, thanks for coming over, Paulo. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Pedro. It's great to be here. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan of your work. We we got I think we got together for the first time in 2016. And there's a couple of things that you probably don't know and I'll be talking about, like you introduced me to my first investor. So because of you, that's how I got the first check uh, on Arena. So I'm very thankful and grateful for being your friend and for participating on, on your podcast. That's awesome. Well, uh, we, we're gonna have to talk about that. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we always like to just talk about the beginning of your life. You know, how was your childhood? Where did you grow up? And the story behind you going from Brazil to the U.S. Yeah, so I grew up at uh, in a small town, relatively small in Brazil, called Uberlândia, uh, more on the countryside uh, of Brazil. And uh, you, you, I had a great time. I mean, I basically had a video game 24 seven. Uh, that was my passion. And I started learning how to code when I was 12 years old. So uh, I was building games for Flash. You know, remember those Flash games that on, on, the, on the web, people were just going crazy with very simple, but that's how I first uh, started understanding more about uh, programming. Um, Right after I, my dream was to build games, so that's that's how I started my 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 desire to be involved with technology. So I grew up thinking about joining a um, computer science program. Uh, that's how I enjoy, I, I joined uh, UFU, uh, the university in, in Uberland, Uberlandia, and they have a partnership for another university in France and. That's how I thought about the opportunity to start working for a video game company because now I could be involved with those large corporations uh, shipping large triple A games. Uh, so that that's how everything started. Um, that's how I, I grew up, and my passion was uh, getting involved with uh, with the video game industry right in, in the beginning. Awesome. Um, and you've lived, so during graduation, you've lived in France for a little bit. Where in France? Yeah, so I was in Lyon. And what is interesting, because the program um, that uh, the, the program between both universities was uh, just a one-year uh, student exchange program, if you will. So you have to co come back, uh, finish your graduation, and, and so on. But that's not what my plan was. So since the beginning, my plan was just to move and not coming back. Uh, but for in order to do that, I did some some hacking. So I started hacking, you know, my way up to, you know, to, to what I wanted, and I shortened my graduation from four years to uh, three years. 
So that uh, taking more classes and making sure that I finish all the all, all the all, all the, the the points, the credits, just so I don't need to come back anymore. Uh, so when I when I so when I went to France, uh, working at uh, studying at uh, Pisa, which is a National Institute of Technology. They, they saw that I already finished everything and they offered me the opportunity to do the master's degree right after. So it means that I did my master's degree even before I finished my graduation. So, you know, in certain way. So that's how I found a way to just extend my, perm my permanence in France and don't need to come back for, uh, to finish the graduation. So. Got it. Well, yeah, you've mentioned something that I think is so important, which is just the ability of identifying hacks in the system. I think that uh, my permanence, at least in the US, before I got my green card, was all, of course, done under the law, but finding glitches in the matrix, uh, you know, and then kind of like giving you a little more room to survive, I would say. Yeah, I, mean, I, I always carry with me that break the rules, don't break the law. So I always thought about how can I find gaps in the system where the society might want me to go for one path, but I find ways that I can leverage some opportunities and then I can just leapfrog towards my goals. That was one of the opportunities. What is the cost? I have just to work, study like crazy, you know, from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And those courses were very, very heavy. Sometimes I had classes at the same day, at the same time. So uh, how I was able to do that, that, that that's the other, the other point. But uh, I was how, taking how classes. Because you, 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 you can't be yeah. places at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So those were one of the things that I, I went to other departments that are having uh, physics and mechanics, engineering, that they're having additional classes. And I was asking them to take those classes if they give me the credits if I pass through those optional uh, classes because that will validate my, my diploma as well. So I, I basically did that and many times I was jumping half of the time attending one class and then running and attending half of the time of the, of the day another class while both are happening at the same time. And then I would catch up with my colleagues and say, hey, what, what, are, what are the things that's going on? Multiple times I was going for exams without having absolute no knowledge of what, what is supposed to, what, what is going to happen. But the, that ability of, uh, of uh, finding ways out, uh, it just forces you, you know, just push you to make, make a miracle. Um, so that, that's yeah. one of the ways that I was able to complete the graduation in three years. I love it. I, I mean, you've, you're touching on two specific points that I think are just really important when it comes to build the character of, uh, of, of, of a leader or even, you know, how we organize the questions for this podcast is, is, is also under, you know, the framework of uh, Joseph Campbell and the Heroes Myth, right? So, which is ultimately, number one is leverage is a very important thing in the universe and when you understand how to properly use it, um, it can certainly give you uh, power to accomplish things uh, faster. I don't think it's something that you want to use every single time, otherwise you overextend yourself and you want to make sure that you're stepping forward in a solid way. Uh, but it's, uh, but, but, but it is, you know, a, a very helpful and, and useful tool. That's, that's one. Um, and the second one that you've mentioned, which I think also score very high on this inevitable ethos is that you put yourself in a semi-impossible position so you had no alternative but to find uh, you know, victory right which is in the end the whole idea of you know incentives uh, being aligned and skimming the game in the meantime if you stop to think about it um, where are the limits where where are we going to break um, and sometimes we are the, you know, we are sabotaging ourselves sometimes. Sometimes uh, the limits way beyond than what we think. But sometimes we overthink. Sometimes we are a little more precautious than we should be. 
So my question is, how far can you push yourself? Where where is your limit? Where until you break? Where where are you gonna be breaking? So I always carry that with me, and what I learned is, the more you keep pushing yourself, the more you push in that limit where you're gonna break. Um, so eventually, you're gonna have a very long uh, uh, resistance uh, before you break. And so far, I never find I never find out where is my limit is. I never find out where it's gonna be my break. And I'll keep pushing that. And, and I, I think that's exciting. Because and then, uh, you know, uh, nothing to lose, everything to win. If you go all in, you're going to have the, the upside is way higher than if you fail trying to reach your limit. You're, you're talking about finding your, your limit. Um, I believe that I have hit a few specific walls at least on the health side, um, in terms of, uh, you know, having, uh, I've had a panic attack. Uh, and, you know, that was, that was weird. I wasn't really sure what was, uh, what was happening. And I think I was, it, it was because I was just pushing myself way too hard until I learned the importance of rest and how rest is important for performance so that you can continue to extend that stamina and the limits because life never gets easier you just get better so i wanted to ask you what have been right like the things that you've done uh, in order to continue to build upon that endurance so it could be you know exercise sleep diet uh spirituality brain help it be like what's your formula i guess for your inevitability yeah that's a, that's a very good point, and I I'm still learning about resting, uh, just because for the last eight years I spend most part of my time sleeping four hours, five hours per day, and for the last four years I didn't sleep a couple of days. So I used to sleep four days a week. Um, and that's not healthy. And it can take you so far if you keep doing that. But I was so obsessed with my end goal that I was willing to go beyond and even compromise my health, compromise my mental health in order to accomplish what I, what I needed to get. Uh, and I'm still learning where where's my, uh, my limits in terms of being healthy and rest enough so I can take to the next st step. I feel that now I'm kind of hitting that that period where I start need to be more work more, let's say, intelligently than work hard, because work hard is default. It's you're always going to be working twelve to sixteen hours per day, but if you want to work smart, you need to rest because if not, you're just going to be like a a truck and just going nonstop. So. One of the things that I like to do is to have my anchor, my anchor in the day. And my anchor has always been uh, martial arts. That's where I, I've been always, always passionate about. And that's where I feel my confidence. I feel myself. And it's more expression of yourself. So the fitness really helped me to anchor my day. So that's why I, I like to reserve 30 to 45 minutes per day just to have that period where I'm just gonna focus in training, jujitsu, judo, uh, lifting weights, but that period that's gonna help me to rest so I can take to the next day with a clear mind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, if you, the, the, the combo, right, would be to be a part of a, uh, a community or, or have, you know, friends and, um, and, and family that will love you unconditionally combined with, you know, access to nature plus fight um, or lift heavy things, you know, sweat, just do difficult physical things. And then, you know, I think the last one would be to spend time in nature, right? You, you're able, in my opinion, these are the four pillars in which you can kick out uh, any form of uh, anxiety, depression, and then, you know, and gives you scientifically, certainly the release of dopamine, oxytocin and so forth, but also putting you into the right frame of, 
of executing on the correct things with leverage. So you're at the end of the day working smarter and not harder. Because uh, when you're talking about sleep deprivation, this was also interesting. Something that changed when I moved to Miami um, was that uh, for a long time, I was waking up uh, at uh, 4 a.m. naturally. And uh, that, you know, but, you know, not because I think that what was driving me was this inner violence of, you know, like you said, just I had to execute on this mission. And that's how I started actually be- becoming a big reader because there was a time where, you know, it was before the sunrise, didn't want to uh, touch my phone. And so I started reading a lot uh, before uh, uh, the day would, would start. And then that was a very important period of, of my life, going to bed early and waking up super early. I still do that today, but at a more reasonable hour and not every day. So I've uh, I've changed and now I sleep a little more, uh, and I am not as stressed. I would say if I don't get, because there's always going to be more work until you die, right? It's always more than you can do, but you but I don't stress about it anymore, and 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 found that compounding progress on a daily basis, even mathematically, is far more powerful than having bursts of energy where you go all the way for a few periods and then you you know shut off and that energetic volatility i think maybe in the early at least you know i think we're both in our early 30s right so in in our early 20s that works exceptionally well but now it's a little different yeah i think it's phases in life there's there are moments in life let's say from 20 to 30 years old you just want to hammer you just want to get stuff done and you do have the energy and many times what i feel that i was not resting because i didn't have the solution so i have to compensate with over execution what i was lacking of so when i got in the valley so i didn't know anyone i didn't have any connections i didn't know how to build a company i didn't know how to start anything and of course, I did participate in unicorns. I did participate in building culture and in scaling companies, but that was not my company. And that's a different game. So I felt that I have to overcompensate that immaturity with uh, over execution. But and then over time, let's say 30 years plus, uh, I think that's the moment where you have to just take a step back, uh, reassess and build a team. Because that's that's how you're going to be able to scale uh, your your business. But otherwise, you you're going to be more uh, uh, limited if you don't uh, go through that period that you have just to go go go. And then on the thirties, you can just okay. Now I have to delegate more, and I can rest and working more strategically than working more operational. Yeah, absolutely. So coming back to your story, then you know, so you finish your studies in France, then did you then at that time, did you move to the US or you stay, go back to Brazil? What, what were the next steps there? Yeah, so uh, it was interesting. Uh, it was a very interesting time because when I got in France, they I, di- I know that I, I would not coming back. Um, and one year passed so fast, so fast. I wasn't able to do absolutely nothing. I was basically learning French working at a wine uh, plantation, um, collecting grapes uh, at a farm next to Lyon. I was working in restaurants just to pay the bills, working as a, 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 a analytics collector of traffic uh, in Lyon. So I was standing in uh, between two intersections collecting data from cars and bikes that was passing in some areas of the city for the city statistics. So I was basically doing anything possible just to survive. And one year it passed so fast, I finished. And then that's why I was like, wait a second, I, I need to just accomplish something here. I cannot go back to Uberland without nothing. And, and then when I joined the master degree, I heard there was an internship between France and US. And I, and I thought, wait a second, that's what I did when I was in, in, that's what I was in Brazil, which is let me go 
not coming back, but I'll do everything possible to finish everything. So I don't need to think about coming back to finish my master's degree. So I did two years of master's degree in France in one year again. And what was the, the, the last part of the program was the intern, it was the internship. You know, you have to do your dissertation, you have to work in a, in a company and so on. And that's where the opportunity happened to move to Houston where I would be studying um, at the University of Houston and working on this other institution that nobody was sharing where I would be working on. And there's some uh, uh, confidentiality regarding the place. I was like, you know what? I just want to go to US. I just want to go to the Valley. Whatever it is, just throw me there. And you ended up in Texas. I ended up in Texas and working <laughs> at NASA as a software engineer. Uh, so the, the, I, I just felt that the, the universe was just putting me into the right direction before I started uh, my career in, in the Valley. That makes sense. Well, I was in Boulder before as well. So I think uh, yeah. it was similar, uh, but I always wanted to go to, I knew that the end game was California at that time. Yeah. Uh, into the beautiful city of Miami. But <laughs> sorry, I, I can't <laughs> go myself. I'm always <laughs> my, uh, so, uh, but very interesting. And, and then was it a through, after NASA, was it through Hulu then that you that you ended up going to California? Yeah, so actually there was a, a few moves before because when, when I, so when I was in Texas, that was 2008, 2009, and uh, because of the real estate bubble, it was very difficult to get a, a sponsor, to get a job. Uh, and I saw myself like, hey, I'm here. I cannot extend my, my visa. I have to find a way to just to keep going. So I decided to go back to France. And when I moved back to France, I was looking for jobs until the economy in the U.S. got back to normal. So that's how I ended up working, moving to, so I moved to, to Paris. I started working at Ubisoft as a, as a data engineer. And I spent another two years, two years and a half working with games, which is fulfilling my dream uh, until I just freaked out and say, what I'm doing here in France, it's time to go back to the war. And that's how I moved back to the US and ended up working at Hulu. Nice. Um, and you, Hulu, were you already living in, in Mountain View or where were you? So at Hulu, the company was based in Los Angeles. Um, oh, so you lived in LA. Right? So I was in LA for five years, actually. Um, I spent, so basically I was one of the first product managers, product advertising, uh, building those ad units that uh, we were competing actually with Netflix at the time. And I, my goal at, at Hulu was to build those beautiful products for advertisers in a way that uh, we would bring more users out of social media. So the goal was to attract more customers and we convert them to subscriptions. And uh, being part of this growth, product manager growth position, uh, I was I was able to see how hard it was to just get those users out of social. I mean, we're talking about Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, uh, a lot of growth outside um, that's happening in social networks. And that's where I have the idea for Arena. For that's 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 the moment that I have the click and say, hey, we need to I need to solve this problem because I have the background in the data and yeah, in uh, artificial intelligence as well. So I was like, hey, we can definitely improve this product that doesn't exist at the time, that we could improve how we can get more users, understand user behavior. And so those three years, almost three years that I spent at Hulu was one, uh, learning about the business, learn about startups, because it was a hyperscale company. And my boss worked with Jeff Bezos for nine years in the early days. So I was able to really learn from, from the beginning uh, how, what it takes to build a, a, a culture that will scale. Uh, second, um, I was able to save money because my salary was really good in, 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 at Hulu and I was single. I didn't have no expenses. I basically was just living at the minimum. And the third was because of my paperwork. So I, the combination of those three 
made me prepare for when I when I, you know I'm ready, I can just make the jump and move to the to the Bay Area, and that's how I end up in 2016 in um, in Mountain View. Got it. So ultimately, even maybe before you've joined Hulu, you've always had the desire to be a founder. Or like, when was that something that became true for you? So when uh, so when I was in in France, so I always been passionate about martial arts, and that's something that I always care with me. That hey, I want to be a superhero. I want to be uh, video games plus martial arts. You know, you you're gonna end up with Dragon Ball. You're gonna end up with all, all kind of crazy, uh, you know. Uh, you do look crazy. like a superhero, by the way, for <laughs> no. those that are not just listening but not seeing. No, uh, it's, it's, follow Paulo on Instagram and you will see. It's, it's more about being very delusional. And I always like to be this delusional, <laughs> which, which actually it's, it's been a dreamer. And being that dreamer just make you know, I want to just be what, you know, a superhero wants to you know, what normally he does. And when I was in working at France um, at, at, at Ubisoft, I decided to, hey, this is my shot to be a UFC champion. Um, and so I, I had my skills in jiu-jitsu and in, in grappling, and I love fighting, so why not? Uh, so I quit my job in 2010. I moved to New York. I started going to Vegas, Los Angeles, training with all the, the, the professional UFC fighters and to find out if I could just ha- you know, handle the, the, the pressure and be able to really take this professionally. So I stayed That's in, in the first six months. I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, I have a lot of injuries here. I have no money. I was living in the basement with 18 people in, in Brooklyn. And it was a very difficult time, but that was my passion, and that's what I wanted to do. So I ended up with uh, training with Renzo, Renzo Gracie in New York, uh, trained with Vanderlei Silva in Vegas, Rafael Cordero, some top, top-tier top UFC trainers and fighters. But I had one problem. I was getting fights, but I, they couldn't sponsor me in order to jump into the octagon and start training and fighting there. And because of that sponsorship, it's just getting more difficult because they keep saying you don't have records. Nobody knows who you are. We cannot sponsor you. You have zero MMA professional MMA fights. Uh, and that's what led me to think about, hey, it might be maybe too late if I just want to start from, from, from the beginning because and then I have to go back to Brazil just to build my records. Uh, and a year later, after going through this adventure, I decided, you know what? I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go to Las, Los Angeles to become an actor. And that started the second part of my life as an actor in Los Angeles. <laughs> I love it. It's like a combination of the Gracie family meets Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> but you end up being a tech founder. <laughs> it's fucking great. It's something that you can't, you can't explain. Um, when, so when, so when, I, when I finished the, this adventure being a fighter, I decided to, A, let me go to, hey, I know martial arts. I like entertainment. Why don't I go to Los Angeles and become a stuntman? And becoming a stuntman, I was able to just start hanging out with actors that would just put me on those long movies. And that was a strategy. So uh, I started going for auditions. Uh, I was doing school you know, uh, acting school and uh, the, the best that I was able to, to do as an actor was doing telenovelas. So I was doing uh, Mexican telenovelas. Oh my like, God, we need food with that. <laughs> and, and that's normally what people are expecting to do. Uh, being a stuntman, you're never going to make it because that's when you, you, they want to keep you doing that. And at the same time, the best I was doing was uh, not IMDb credit uh, films, which is not good because you're you're in LA. You want to get IMDb credits because this is the database of if you're part of a movie. Uh, it's their pitch book, basically. I guess it, their crunch base or something like that. Crunch base, you, yeah. You can you can mention uh, crunch base, but that's basically what it, what it was. 
And after six months, I was able to get a, a, a participation with a script and in a long move, movie for Paramount Studios. And they came to me and said, Where, where's your paperwork? Where are you sponsored? How are you here? And that just came back to the same point that I was before, which is, hey, I don't have my visa. I don't have my, my, my work permit. I have the visa, but I didn't have the work permit to become and receive uh, uh, you know, funds uh, to be part of the movie. Uh, and that's how I, I decided, you know what? Let me go back to do what I do best and become more a fan of martial arts and UFC and appreciate actors and movies and but being an artist probably is not going to be my my thing and and that that's how I started just looking for jobs and I end up uh, working at uh, at Hulu wow I love it it's funny that this inevitability or this desire to succeed, the self-reliance and the perseverance are very similar, right? No one starts. I was watching the Kanye West uh, documentary on Netflix recently, and it's fascinating to see the amount of rejection that he also faced, right? Or J.K. Rowling. I mean, everyone. I mean, no one that managed to do something exceptional and memorable. Um, just had all the doors, you know, fully, fully open, and that, and the struggle is a is a big part of um, of that because then you can build your success on a solid foundation. Yeah, right? and the, the the thing what I feel is, and you probably relate to this, you have a chip in your shoulder because when you fail or get rejection on something that you are all in, this is your life. You just start building that chip on your shoulder that I'm I'm not gonna give up. You know, I, I'm I'm not gonna stop, and and eventually you learn that every single no takes you closer to a yes, and like Mark Cuban said, you know you don't need to be right all the time. You need to be right one time in life, and if you if you're right one time, you make it. So failure and rejections is just those process that is just preparing you for that one opportunity, that one yes that you get, and then you can make a big break. That's right. No, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's very, very true. And I think that uh, absolutely relate to that, not only on having the, the, you know, the, 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 the chip on the shoulder, because for instance, I remember uh, uh, when I got the job at uh, Feathers Club as an associate, right? Like, I mean, I was basically joining an elite firm in the Bay Area. We see the 26 unicorns with great people, but I didn't go to Stanford nor Harvard, right? I studied journalism in Brazil. So what the fuck am I? And I was competing against all these NBA kids. And I was like, when it comes to this hacking the system, the, the idea I had, I was like, I guarantee that everyone else that's competing against me under those positions are probably these super arrogant, obnoxious people that are going through these programs. And nothing against them. If I funded many MBAs, I think MBAs are great. If you want to do it, go do it. You know, I don't have a thing against it. Uh, there is though a stigma because half I think of the people that attend these programs to keep hearing how special they are for you know two consecutive years. I'm not sure how much yeah. that helps them. Meaning, I, I I knew that some of those folks are going to just say yes. Uh, I I'm not going to prepare. I'm not going to do anything. I spoke with over thirty CEOs when I was still at Sendgrid, letting them know that I was applying for a job in venture. And if I got the job and they gave me the opportunity to talk about their company and their metrics, maybe mm -hmm. if I get the job, they will get a check. <laughs> That's literally like how that whole thing kind of like. Uh, 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 got started and uh, one of them was Alessio by the way right and then we ended up funding Piper uh, you know yeah. that, uh, that first check was at a six million dollar valuation and you know now the company raised a hundred forty million dollar uh, uh, yes you know, CVC. so it's basically just uh, uh, um, it goes to actually I'm, I don't know if it's 140 it's like 90 I, I, I'm sorry I, I, I just read those out. but the point is that before the interview the first phone call, the phone screen, I already had written two full investment memos on opportunities I wanted to present to them. And they were shocked. They were like, who the fuck is this guy? Mm -hmm. Like he spoke with 30 CVOs, he writes like two investment memos. So I was always appro approaching things almost with like, um, it's this combination of hacking, but also brute force hustle. 
as long as you're not breaking things, um, you know, and, and similar to you, right? You know, you will find angles and um, and opportunities, and, and and make sure that you have the humility to be around people that are better than you, because that's how you get better and how you learn. Right? Absolutely, and let let me go back to that time and how I met Alessio, because Alessio he introduced us, I think, uh, back in 2016, and when he so when he was at 500 startups uh with his five team members um founding team and just building the first version of the product just scaling the company just raising their seat round i was able to meet with him and uh, that was the process where i started learning from people that i want to be like and i always carry that with me i I want to hang out with lions. I want to hang out with people that I, I admire and I want to be 10% what they are. And that's how I met him. Uh, I, every time that I had opportunity, I was going to 500. And when he, he, he finished the program, we keep in touch every single time. And I was at Hulu at the time. I, di I, didn't, I didn't start the company yet. I was just building the prototype, Moon Lightning, working nights and weekends to build the first version. But I was not even full time yet. And when and throughout the, this period of time, he introduced, he said, hey, you should talk to this guy because this guy, he is, he's really well connected and he's a hustler. And that's how we met each other. Um, and then I remember you were an animal. You were just all over the place, he introduced me so many other people. And I was raising my, my seed and before Techstars program, just trying to learn and getting a lot of re rejections. And you were really helped me left and right and without asking nothing so this helping forward culture in the valley really uh it's kind of really connect people right it really makes it makes a difference because uh even now with with alessio for example he still helps me he mentors me f towards scaling building fundraising and uh i mean i'm so thankful but he never asked nothing for me and i feel so grateful for you and alessio so just to be around you guys it makes me want to help not only you guys but other entrepreneurs that wants to be part of uh building something as well yeah no that's i think that what you're talking about is precisely the bedrock and the foundation of you know what, we're, what we have at Atman and how I see the world and because of what you felt as well. I think something that really clicked me, I was watching this uh, uh, talk by uh, Tim O'Reilly, right? Uh, and, you know, basically the creator, right? Like of the, of the web. And then um, he talked about how uh, open source usually uh, works. And then that open source is all about adding more value than what you can capture. And I think that that's the way that you want to see um you know when you actually go out of your way to help people is to do it um and be grateful that you have the chance to do it not expect anything in return and uh yeah. and keep uh, uh, uh moving on and, and and i think that you know people like yourself people like alessio people like many others you make it easy to be helped and i think that that's the most in, in, important thing oftentimes i think people um maybe this also has to do a little bit with the the intricacies of Silicon Valley etiquette, but it's kind of like these folks that don't give you any context and ask for your time and they want to just hang out and they don't really, uh, you know, one thing for sure is that you've always put yourself in a position to be helped very fast. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's also something that, you know, we, we often see with all, with all the best CEOs, you're prepared uh, for that moment of, you know, luck, I would say. It's almost as like this quote that's literally on my wall here. It says, luck, right? Like is when preparation meets opportunity is really my favorite quote of all time from Seneca. And, and I, I don't know if it is from him because it's been a while, I guess, but uh, allegedly it is. And, and, and I think that that's what, what, the, what, what life is about. It's not even just Silicon Valley, you know, it's um, um, all how people get these breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like the idea of you gotta be very concise, precise and be able to be in a position to be helped so every time when i ask for help which is something that i hate to do i hate ask people for help i always try to make things very easy f without frictions and that anyone can just jump in and spend a couple of minutes and be very helpful uh to 
to help solve the problems. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's that's part of very important part of being um, uh, being an entrepreneur because uh, the same way you have to put your shoes, you put yourself in the other shoes that hey, I'm going to be help someone, but please make my life help uh, uh, you know uh, uh, easy so I can give you the value that you're looking for. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Um, amazing. So. Uh, what was the the beginning? You want to talk about the early days of Arena, basically the moment that because you were saving some money. I guess it was the first time, probably where you starting having maybe a reasonable balance between chaos and order in your life, right? Like you've had a steady job where you're around people that are uh, in a good company that's growing very fast. You're learning a lot. You're making good money. You're living in an, in an interesting city. Um, like LA and, and then you know but at some point you're saving up you're thinking about that moment when is that moment that you're that you that you make the decision all right I'm doing it I'm quitting and I'm all in I always knew that I was going to do this it never been a, a, a matter of questions um, I knew that that would be temporary and I'll give it all I'll give everything uh, when I started at Hulu I was very underqualified uh, to be around the, the caliber of people. And in the first two months, I was sure they would fire me. But I worked so hard throughout the way that in six months later, my first day, I was doing the work of 50 people in the company. And, and so I, I was basically doing three departments, work, taking everything home, working from 7 a.m. to 3 a.m., um, and absolutely doing as he was my company. And after six months, I knew that I want to build my Hulu. I want to, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I, I, I always never been a good fit in society. So I was, I never, I don't know what it is, hang out and just have, you know, drinks. I never had that. And I don't know, I don't never sit down to watch TV. I don't, I don't know that experience. And you work at Hulu, I love it. Yeah, and I was working at Hulu. <laughs> you want to be an actor. I, I want to be an actor. <laughs> but, and that's very interesting, because if you think about even fighters, they, they don't watch fights. They don't watch UFC. They, they don't watch fights. And many many actors, they don't watch themselves. They don't watch movies. Because they, they are that. They live that. And I, I bought my first television during the pandemic so i uh, so i think Sorry. that's a, it's it's another thing that i think we have in common i i would say that um you know the whole thing about josh wolf the founder of lux capital he always says like chip on the shoulders equal chips on the pocket and you know sequoia talks about where like we find the the resolute the underdogs and i like this quote about you know partnering certainly with inevitable people of course but just we've also well-mannered misfits right because um, I, I, I mean, I, I love like how you said it. You're like, I, I, I never fit in society. Like you, you said it in a different way. I, I forgot that. Uh, but, but how you just said that you always feel like you're this, that you're very true to your authentic self, but you always feel like you're an outsider that, you know, maybe the only way to really find peace is within. Um, and, 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 and I, and I find that like a, an excellent warrior like, uh, mentality. Um, right, so, uh, but coming back, okay, so was there a moment specifically that you're like, all right, this is what I'm doing, and I got to go to the Bay Area, you know? That yeah, stuff. and that was the time where I felt that was the, the, the perfect timing that I had uh, a couple of money in the bank. I basically didn't have to worry more about my my, my visa and, and, and all my, my green card, everything was in place. And I quit the job, I moved to my car, and I drove from Santa Monica to Mountain View, and I spent a year and a half leaving my car while I was bootstrapping the company. So I could take the money that I have saved to pay uh, freelancers and some developers and designers to help me to build the first iteration of the product before we joined Techstars, because and then that was the time where, okay, now we start getting some of, uh, of the angel investment and we can scale a little bit more. But before, 
that time, I was basically living in my car, sleeping, parking my car in front of 24 Fitness, so I, I couldn't have problems in sleeping in the car overnight, uh, working in a co-working space called Hacker Dojo, which is a very traditional and very... Yeah, well, I room. didn't know that you did that, because that is like a hustle thing that some people, you know, there's a, there are Quora posts about it, but you actually slapped in your car, the, the whole the Google parking lot thing. Wow. Yeah, I did. And and many times, that's how I learned how not to sleep. So that's how I was able to just be awake four time, uh, uh, three times a night in a week. Because basically when I was working, I didn't stop. You know, and sometimes I just close my eyes for a few hours, sitting down and just wake up and just keep working and keep building. Um, and from that time that I was like, you know, it makes no difference if I'm working in this co-working space and not sleeping or sleep in my car or sleep on the streets. It makes no difference because sleeping is just, just closing your eyes for a few hours where you're more vulnerable because you don't know what's going on externally. And and let's let's get the work done. So that, that was when uh, I really knew that I was born for this. I love it. Um, so as you then began building it, so you, you did Techstars in, in, in LA or in Texas, Sh right? Or Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. And you, it was like, mid yeah, okay. Midwest. Okay. Uh, Midwest. And then after Chicago, you're like, okay, I'm moving back to, to, uh, to Mountain View. And why did you never, like, why always Mountain View, never San Francisco, just out of curiosity? Well, actually, it was just a matter of just uh, more familiar with the valley. And I knew that that could be more expensive if we were in San Francisco. And in fact, it is more expensive. There's, there's the convenience for sure. Uh, but because, I mean, I was leaving my car and I just, you know, I, I knew the area. If I need to go there, I just can drive. And I was right. I think it was the right time that I should stay in, in the, more in the South Bay area just because of the, the cost of living. They'll be way more affordable yeah. um, to be there. I also think that like, you know, nothing really happens there, right? Like, you know, these cities are like really, really like tiny little cities and yeah. you've got all the beautiful hikes and nature, but like, I mean, there isn't a, like a nightlife for tons and tons of culture. So I, I actually think that this is one of the reasons why uh, Silicon Valley developed into what it was because it allowed people to properly have good life work, you know, work life yeah. balance, but work like sixteen hour days. And that, so forth. Like that's double. exactly what it is. And and yeah. I, I can I can double down on, on this topic because in, there's no much going on. Actually, it's a lot of, you know, it's very calm. There's not a lot of actions happening in the valley. So that was for me that was perfect because I want to focus and I want to just work and. Saturday nights, I'll be in front of my computer until 1 a.m. working and getting, making progress. So there was a combination of not having distractions and also more affordable. Yeah, perfect. I, I mean, I think that that's exactly one of the main reasons that it made, you know, this part of the world uh, so, so special. Um, and you know, how was you, you've managing the ability of like having customers in Brazil versus in the US for, for Arena? Or if you want to just talk about like some examples of the actual problems that you that you solve for, for some of these customers. Yeah, so when I was at Hulu, I was able to learn how difficult it was to acquire new customers, uh, engage with users, in a way that we could understand their behavior because if you think about it, you don't have access to data that are, face, that are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Amazon. You know, you have those, limit, you have those limitations that you, you don't have access to your customers, your users. So that was the moment where I thought about building a product that would be involving content engagement and later on, we are producing so much data that uh, it makes sense for us to build what is called a CDP, a customer data platform. Um, with those two products, experience a product and a, a customer data platform, uh, we would be able to help every single, uh, every single enterprise customer 
to create that engagement that it would be outside social and help them to have ownership over that data. So what you think is, Irene is a white label of Google or Facebook or Amazon and create that real-time conversation with users. Instead of spending time on hashtag Twitter or Facebook search and so on, let's bring those customers to your page, build a community, have them to engage in a conversation like Discord does or Slack. Um, you can think of like YouTube streaming or Instagram streaming that has that chat experience where users can engage uh, directly one-on-one -on -one, or also in a group conversation and promote that brand awareness in that community. So that's how the product started getting more traction. We made the product easy to be deployed uh, for every single website or mobile app. So you can just copy, copy and paste the code and then we're gonna create a chat experience on your product. Once the users, they start landing your page, what's the first thing that happens? They create an account. When they create an account, that's where they authenticate, produce the first party data, and we're able to carry that information to the data platform where we apply artificial intelligence to understand the customer behavior and help marketers to do more personalized and meaningful experiences for marketing campaigns, advertising, push notifications, email, in a way that we can now bring those users back to the platform and create a very, uh, uh, very strong flywheel between getting users, engage with them, and then offering products for upsell and cross-sell. That's why Arena works really well for customers that are on the e-commerce space, virtual events, um, uh, financial institutions. We have Nubank that is, is one of... Vitax, one of customers as well, and uh, the product is just organic growing. Um, and this product lab growth motion help us to get a distribution that today we have 25,000 customers in 150 countries. That's incredible. Uh, well, so very, very special uh, story. And I think it's people oftentimes might not realize the sheer complexity of uh, solving this problem because you have uh, way too many inputs and outputs of data with the customer behavior changing dramatically in terms of uh, you know maybe you're you're watching something on your phone or you're watching something on your uh, television or your laptop while you're also looking at your phone at the same time and just uh, as behavior changes in terms of media consumption how can advertisers and, and brands overall even just properly interact and communicate with their audience in a way that it is helpful for the end customer, not something intrusive like those pop-up banners you know, that we used to have back in the day. And if you think about where where is the opportunity here, the opportunity is that cookies will disappear in the next 12, 18 months. Uh, so that's something that Google already announced. Uh, we know there is a very strong conflict between Facebook and iOS. Uh, in terms of privacy and access to, to data. And that's just going to make it even harder for companies to even understand more about their users. And now every single company are looking ways to build their own engagement platform with their data platform. And that's where we are right sitting on top of a gold mine as the market is shifting towards our direction because that's going to be natural for every single company. And think about e-commerce. Think about how Shopify got to decide what it is because it's just enabling people to create e-commerce experiences with their own products. What we do is we enable any website to create social experiences and have access to their data, to their customer data. Uh, so that's where the opportunity it is for the next 12 to 24 months. Incredible. Um, and recently also, you, you, you just announced a, uh, your Series A. Um, how was the process of, uh, of, of raising that round? Um, and did you go out of, out of the way when you're like, look, I'm going to go once I have a you know, certain amount of traction or you know, how much your previous investors uh, participated in it and so forth? Uh, it would be interesting just to learn the dynamics of how that round kind of came to light. Um, and um, I mean, the overall story behind it. Yeah, when, when I got here um, and I, went, I was bootstrapping the company, I knew that there's two type of 
founders. There was the founders that were serious entrepreneurs. There were the founders of Twitter and other massive companies with a lot of successful track record. And there's the other type of entrepreneurs that didn't have that. They didn't have network or didn't know how to pass that social proof that was very difficult. So early, early on, I learned that you have to be so good that you can't be ignored. And I carried that through this process of raising the seed round. So we raised 2.5 million in 2020. And I keep the same notion that regardless if I have a network or not, I'm going to be so good. I'm going to have the best metrics possible that I cannot be ignored, that people want to work with me. And that, that was a natural process going through this pandemic that accelerated our growth. Uh, 2021, I was able to put the company in a position that we grew 10x compared to last year. And that, that, that customer growth uh, with revenue growth and expansion of those enterprise accounts was the signals that com- the investors were looking for entrepreneurs that came from possibly the background that we have with that grit and with that obsessive desire to win, plus a great product with a technical background in order to invest and be part of this now hyperscale mode that we are entering in, in, in the next couple of you know, months. Uh, that's how, how we were able to put together. Uh, it was a fast process with three weeks um, when we started talking to investors to be able to uh, find the, the right partners for the next phase. That's great. Well, congratulations. But uh, I think the, 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 the not so fast process, but ultimately very hard was to put the business in their disposition where, you know, you're, we always say this, right? You want to raise money uh, with optionality from a position of strength. And ultimately, you have to earn, right, um, uh, uh, that place in the arena and just to have a little pun there. <laughs> you know, because yeah. uh, 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 and and so my, my my actual question to you, um, more than just around, was what were the levers that actually you were like, hey, we found product market fit, now we can scale up the size of these existing contracts or, or different. Was there a client? Was there a specific product feature? What was that moment where you crossed into this? land of, uh, of, uh, of growth. It, it's, a, it's a combination of multiple uh, characteristics that a business needs to have. Um, and learning and understand what are the things that investors are looking for just make me reverse engineer and, and start building what they're looking for. And one of the things are uh, the risk in the business. How I can de risk their investment or how they can invest in a company that is going to be not a billion dollar company, but a $10 billion company. What are the traits in an entrepreneur that they're looking for? So I was making this more evident for them. So when they learn more about the company, they say, oh, this is what I'm looking for. Um, we have a very interesting distribution model that are easy for us to acquire new customers, which is this PLG product lab growth motion. Uh, We have a virality component in our product, and we also have a network effect in our backend. So when I created Arena, I made sure that every single new user that is using the product is adding more value, and that value is compounding to make the network more effective. So those are, speaking of the product, those are the things that investors are looking for, where we're going to spread as a viral. Um, other components, we're very capital efficient. Uh, I think that maybe came more about my background, how I think that we should grow, grow the company in a more sustainable and efficient way. Uh, we know the value. As an immigrant, we have this immigrant mentality. We know how much cost a dollar. So I was able to build a company that we were breaking even in July last year. So... When investors they saw, they say, hey, you have a very healthy business. And being able to be a default alive at that stage was a big plus. Um, being the founder and being the person that is leading the company and having that grit 
and have the ability to hire talents, especially product engineering, uh, which is very difficult to retain. That was one of the characteristics that they, they saw, uh, how I was growing and scaling the, the team. And the size of the market, uh, the opportunity where we are landing because of companies are going to be looking more in, for engagement, for more data, and uh, how people are, customers are adopting the product. What's the size of the, 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 the tickets of the, the deals? So we are selling to SMEBs, and then we sell into mid-market, and then we, ha we have half a million dollar deals with large telecom and broadcasters. So th those are the dynamics that uh, investors, they see that we have opportunities for going from bottom up and going top down. And if you combine all this in one organization, that's where they see, I want to be part of, of this. Wonderful. Uh... Yeah, maybe after this incredibly technically accurate but passionate speech, maybe you can pull requests. Uh, <laughs> uh, Paul, as we approach you know the hour here, I uh, wanted to also make sure that we talk about you know cer certain certain things uh, about you, right? So we all, I, I think these are interesting questions at least. So you know, just to to, to wrap it up, um, and certainly of course you know give you the opportunity to say any final messages uh, that you may desire to you know to share, but. Uh, the number one question I always like to ask is just your morning routine. In, a, in an ideal world, you know, uh, if you can control every aspect of your morning, how does it look like? Yeah. That? So I wake up every day at 4.50 a.m. Uh, so a little bit late after you. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a person that I, I got used to waking up early um, just because we have a distributed team. And at 5 a.m. I have my first meeting with, uh, with my team in Brazil. Um, and uh, I go through from 5 a.m. until 8 p.m. nonstop. You know, I had sometimes I have meetings that I have to, you know, deploy myself, but mostly it's just in front of the computer nonstop and just quick breaks for lunch and, 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 and get some snacks. But uh, only after 8, 9 p.m. that I'm able to just decompress a little bit, go to the gym, go train jujitsu and then um, just plan for the next day. Very basic, I don't have any um, complex routine, it's just basically waking up early, spending most part of, of my morning working with the team, and more in the afternoon, more strategic, more the next steps. And now that we are scaling the company, my focus is hiring, uh, hiring the leadership team, so we can go from the, the, the stage that we are now and expand to, to another sprint for, for, for the, ne the next fin financial round. But basically, that's, that's my daily routine. And uh, from Monday to Friday and weekends, I like to spend more time with more um, uh, exercises. So I do hot yoga. I do, you know, go train and go run. And so I do more uh, physical activities so I can just put my mind in the right place and be ready for Monday, um, you know, for, for another, another round. I love it. Um, was there anything that you started doing recently that significantly improved your life? Could be something small. Yeah. I, I always discover things that I like and that I, that I enjoy, some micro things. Um, I mean, hot yoga, it's something that I never, never have done before. Maybe it might be a little bit like your cold bath that is crazy, it's insane, but it might help you to concentrate in things that you never thought about before. Uh, so the hot yoga thing, it was something that I never find out that is going to impact my life the way it is. So I'm doing, I'm doing this once a week. Um, and uh, I think going for a walk, uh, sometimes I just take 10 minutes just to go for a quick walk. And that's just helped me to put my mind in the right place. Um, and, and talking to my family, I talk to my family every day. I think it's, it's, a, it's a time that's very precious to me. And I pray. Uh, and I have this meditation mindset. Every day I spend five minutes in the morning. And then before I go to sleep, I spend another five minutes just to be more thankful and grateful for the day. 
and uh, that makes me just be ready for the next day. And I just repeat that over and over. I really think that routine is what keep you on track. And if you have a routine, if you have discipline, you can just keep compounding that value that's over time is going to pay off. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a lot of similarities and uh, thanks for sharing. Um, you know, I think this was a, it was an incredible episode. I also learned new things about you, which is often the case, but this one, these were a little surprising. I was not aware of both the MMA and the acting uh, <laughs> attempts. Um, so, so that was, uh, that was, it was pretty cool, but, uh, just wanted to thank you, uh, Paula for your time and, um, and congratulate you for, you know, everything you've achieved so far, e everything you will also achieve and, you know, so, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll see each other in person either when I'm back in California or when you come to me. Absolutely. And I want to thank you and uh, congrats on building this this media uh, empire that I want to see you creating. I think you, you have this charisma around you and carry so much experience around venture, uh, venture capitalism, uh, around entrepreneurship, uh, what you have done in Brazil, now you've done here. And I think it's, it's so remarkable that is, is, is none but inspiring for me and for other people. So uh, congrats on, on, on your, your projects. I'm very excited to see where you're going to go. And um, you can always rely on me if you need anything, you know, where to, where to find uh, Arena and, and myself here in the Bay Area. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paulo. Uh, and see you guys on the next episode of the Inevitable Podcast. Thanks for listening. Cheers.